Uh, welcome, guys. Uh, so, you see, this is uh, what I'm trying to do is basically a case based uh, ECG discussion. So, ECG is something I've always wanted to teach. So, uh, more than teaching cardiology, actually, for some of you might know that I have a YouTube channel. It's not very active right now, but that's how I first got started. So, uh, this is something I always wanted to do. And I aim to do it in a different way. So, whether it's a success or not is probably up to you. So uh, I think uh, uh, we need significant engagement from the uh, participants. And uh, this is one platform where you can say the absolute uh, ridiculousness, whatever you want. So you may not come up with the correct diagnosis. So this is, you can say whatever you feel like it's not a problem. So I'll just uh, give you a, a brief uh, introduction. So this is basically a case-based ECG discussion. And if this is probably successful and this is something which interests you, I think uh, we can continue this uh, a weekly sessions going forward. All right. So this is William Eindhoven. So he is the one who uh, first uh, uh, invented this electrocardiogram and gave us an electrical window into the heart. This is what a problem is. Many people treat ECG something like this. So can anyone say what this is? Any of your participants? What is this? Okay. People treat uh, electrocardiograms like this. So this is basically Egyptian hieroglyphics. So this is how people see uh, electrocardiograms. You can see all this pictorial representations of birds and dogs and all those things. So this is how people see ECGs, unfortunately. Okay, you can't blame them. See, uh, both of them are basically pictorial representations. Okay, so what you see on your left is your ECG and it's basically pictorial representations. It is similar to hieroglyphics. And for centuries, we could not decipher what uh, the Egyptian hieroglyphics meant until we found this. So can anyone tell me what this is? Any volunteers? It's around, uh, say, around 170 people are there. Can anyone guess what this is, which provided a key to decipher our Egyptian hieroglyphics? Okay, so this is called the Rosetta Stone. Okay, this was disc discovered in 1799. And this is, I think, uh, one... Candidate has raised it. Okay, I'll just say the answer. It's a Rosetta Stone. So this guy discovered in 1799. And this was the key to unlocking the Egyptian language. Okay, so remember the ECG is uh, one thing which you have to know the language for. So just like you had this Rosetta Stone to unlock uh, the Egyptian language, similarly, you have ECG books, you have lectures. You need to put in some effort in order to understand electrocardiograms. It is the single greatest investigation, lab investigation of modern medicine. There is no test which provides as much information as that of the humble ECG. So the problem is we often don't know how to learn uh, to read this language. It requires a lifetime of learning. So that's a problem. It is not something like you can go for an online course or, or even a classroom course for say one month and become a master on it. It requires a lifetime of learning. So what is the purpose of this session? I told you it requires a lifetime of learning. This is to inculcate in you a love for ECG. That is, you want to know more about this uh, fascinating uh, investigation. Yeah. They, see, I can. there's no point in me coming and telling you that this is what a right bundle branch block looks like or this is what a left bundle branch uh, block looks like. My aim with this session is to tell you, is to show you how powerful ECG can be or to open uh, to you the magic of electrocardiograms, okay, so that you are inspired and you can you go and learn more about ECGs. Okay, so this is a this is something I want to tell you. This is something I want to tell you very strongly. Every ECG tells you a story, but the problem is it does so in a different language. Okay, you have to learn that language. See, there'll be people who are among you who speak three languages, who speak four languages, who speak five languages. Suppose you know a new language, you get a lot of information. At least you can get to see the movies of that particular language. So you get, it gives you a great advantage. So remember this, every ECG tells you a story, but it does so in a different language. Unfortunately, we don't, we don't want to read that story. We don't want to learn that language. The first thing what we do is when we get the ECG, we hardly look at it. We just put it back in the same cover in which it came. Or when we get the ECG, we look for T inversion or ST depression or ST elevation. Beyond that, most of the doctors don't do anything. But remember this, it is a very, very powerful tool and I'm here to show you how powerful it is. So this is a story which the ECG said, and it's a very sad story. 
it's an st elevation mi which is breaking down into a ventricular fibrillation so a very sad story for this particular patient okay so we have 10 cases here okay so this is uh, patient zero so this is a case which i had actually done a 10 minute cme for in marrow so would anyone like to it's a very simple one it's a 45 year old chest pain of 4 hours duration so would anyone like to attempt the ccg so i had uh, just before the session started we had uh, instructed candidates to have a look at an 8 to 10 9 minute video of mine so if anyone who's not seen that video can raise their hand and can try to attempt the ccg would anyone like to try so 45 year old chest pain so somebody has raised their hand okay would anyone like to try 45 year old anterior lateral wall mi sir okay anterior lateral wall mi that's one candidate has said the other one anyone else lbb tom stone elevation sir okay the other one next one lbbb sir i don't think it's a left funnel branch block but anyway that's beside the point so all of you agree it's an anterior wall mi right yeah. yeah all of you agree it's an anterior wall mi right okay so i uh, it's an anterior wall mi there's no doubt about it but again i want uh, you to stop here see uh, you will find a link in the uh, description i think vaishnav you can post a link there for my video okay it's a 9 okay. minute video okay i want you to after the session go and have a look at it okay why did you stop at making a diagnosis of anterior wall mi i told you the ecg tells you a lot more information so unfortunately you have stopped when you see this st elevation our minds get closed here and we stop at this particular point there is a lot more information to be from, to be earned from this ecg as i told you every ecg tells you a story unfortunately it's in a different language so the ecg tells you about the diagnosis the pathophysiology the site of lesion prognosis likely clinical status and even the management so the diagnosis is an anterior wall mi the pathophysiology is it's complete total occlusion of the left anterior descending by a red thrombus so the stemi stemi is by a occlusion complete occlusion the artery is obviously the lad and the thrombus is actually a red thrombus a fibrin rich thrombus the site of lesion is a proximal lad why because you see 2 3 avf showing st depressions and v1 showing an st elevation of about around 5 mm so it's a proximal lesion so guys today we will be dealing with the topic diverticular diverticular just one second i just have a yeah so uh, just one second so you have, so the site of lesion is a proximal lad because uh, the uh, whatever i said the prognosis is actually a bad prognosis why because one it's a proximal lad a huge area of myocardium is involved to the pattern of st elevation you can see it's a, what we call a tombstone or a shark fin pattern or a, so what happens is it the st elevation obliterates the r wave so here you can see the st elevation obliterates the descending limb of the r wave this is a very bad prognostic sign okay the clinical status you can see this patient is in tachycardia so it's probably in heart failure or pre heart failure the management is you can do a primary pci or thrombolysis depending on the center so so many so so much information was there in this ecg i have described this in further detail your link link is posted you can have a look so much information is got from the ecg but most of most of us stop at committing upon a diagnosis of anterior wall mi okay so this is what just what i said so uh, i'm not going to repeat it but basically this is the gist of it so 45 year old chest pain all this information was there but our minds was closed upon seeing the st elevation okay so what we are going to do is we are going to take a different approach okay so uh, we are going to uh, take a approach similar to sherlock holmes okay so you see but do you observe okay so i'm going to remove that particular bias from you i want you to treat the ecg like a crime scene okay so i'm not going to tell you about the diagnosis or the clinical status of the patient i am just going to post the ecg to you okay and you should tell me about the diagnosis clinical status and whatever questions i pose so if i give you an st elevation of anterior wall mi and tell you the patient is having chest pain your mind stops there you just come it as an anterior wall mi so i'm just going to post ecgs for you and you tell me about the likely diagnosis the clinical status and the questions which i'm going to post so this is going to be like a sherlock holmes uh, crime scene so remember treat the ecg like a crime scene so as i told you every ecg tells you a story you just have to be able to read that particular story so this is case number 1 so just finish case 0 so there are nine more cases so case number 
Okay. This is a 50 year old hypertensive diabetic. It's acutely sick. The patient is acutely sick. ECG was taken after the patient was partially treated. So I'm not telling you how the patient came. I'm not telling you anything else. I'm just telling you this is a, a 50 year middle aged patient who was acutely sick and uh, ECG taken after the patient is partially treated. So you can have a look at this ECG. I just come back. See, all these ECGs are from my clinical practice. And there are some ECGs which have been sent to me by uh, you guys. All right. So I'll just come to the questions first. You must tell me what did this patient suffer from? If you want, you can note it down. What did this patient suffer from? Why? What are their evidences? And what do you expect the echo to show? So what did this patient suffer from? Why? What are their evidences? And what do you expect the echo to show? So this is your ECG. You can take your time and remember you can, you can say any particular blunder you want, all right? We can go for correction later on. The purpose, see, uh, I'm, I'm aware I'm dealing with a heterogeneous group of audience, okay? So some people might be first year PGs who might not have a very clear cut idea on ECG. Some people might have a very good idea on ECG. The purpose is not to tell you what a left bundle branch block or what right bundle branch block looks like. The purpose of this session is to tell you about the amount of information you can get from an ECG provided you are willing to uh, learn its language. All right. So that is something I want. That is, that is what I want to communicate. This is not to teach you about this particular ECG. It's to give you a sense of idea that you can get so much information from a particular ECG. That's why I'm masking all the clinical status. If I were to tell you the clinical status, then your mind automatically becomes biased. You don't want to learn more about it. That's why I'm hiding the clinical status. I'm just, uh, these are the questions you have to answer from this ECG. So if anyone would like to try, I mean, blunders are accepted. They're not a problem. So would anyone like to try? Yeah. Sir, uh, sinus tachycardia with LVH with strain pattern, sir. Okay. Okay, so, so one candidate says sinus tachycardia. Sir, LVH with strain. patient That's might have inferior, inferior volume MI with LVH, sir. With the, uh, I, yeah, I don't think problems. he has an inferior volume because uh, if you there's the obviously no ST elevation at least in two three AVF, so I don't think you can commit upon an inferior volume, right? All right. He's gone into your pulmonary edema, sir. Since the rose again, uh, why? Pattern. Again, the first question is what did this patient suffer from? Why? Then you have to tell me why do you think this patient is having, having pulmonary edema? There was an acute LV failure due to the yeah, why, uh, why? LVH. Yeah, LVH so can already be there, right? Nah. See, so if you take these patients, yeah. Hypertensive emergency. Okay, no, okay, it could be hypertensive emergency, but you must tell me why. The problem is the ECG, heart failure with the pressure rejection fraction, the hypertension with diabetes. The form of again, why, function. why? What, what does this ECG, Diastolic what is this function? Diastolic dysfunction. Exactly. So what in this ECG makes you think that this patient could have Say heart failure, diastolic dysfunction, and all. LVH with strain LVH, is there. Sir. Again, left theater take, enlargement. Exactly. Even That's a very important point. Plus Remember, V6 is greater than 35 mm, sir. That is LVH, right? See, you take this ECG one week ago, you will still find LVH. LVH is not going to disappear. LVH will LVH be there. Left theater enlargement. That's a very, very important sign. Left theater enlargement. That is accepted. Okay. Could it be a case of aortic stenosis, sir? Could be a case of aortic stenosis. Again, that's why I'm asking you to guess everything. That is why I'm not giving you the clinical could picture. Could it be how come, how come? hypertrophic yeah, could be, uh, cardiomyopathy? Yeah, could be hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. <laughs> no, but what did this patient present with? Okay, pulmonary edema. So that's why I'm saying this patient presented with pulmonary edema. Okay, so why do you think pulmonary edema? Diastolic heart failure, sir. Because Again, of okay, it could be that the there is peak T wave. Peak T wave. There is peak T wave. Okay, I'm not getting you here. Okay, I'll give you. I think I'll tell you the answer. So, what did this patient suffer from? This patient probably would have suffered from acute pulmonary edema. He would have been stabilized. Why do I say it? Remember, it is sinus tachycardia. Okay, there is some degree of sinus tachycardia. What I can see is left atrial enlargement and LVH with strain. All right. There is also a left anterior hemi block. Okay. So, but what does the LVH suggest? The LVH suggests structural heart disease. All right. That is probably, there is hypertensive heart disease. There's some degree of structural heart disease. What does the left atrial abnormality say? This patient has elevated LA pressures. 
all right so tachycardia acutely sick patient with pre existing elevated la pressures and structural heart disease i would strongly think of pulmonary edema in this patient all right so is everyone clear with this sir why la enlargement again why there will be a certain you see la enlargement will be many things but in this case i would strongly think of diastolic dysfunction okay see if, if you see la enlargement in the absence of mitral valve disease you must strongly consider a diagnosis of diastolic dysfunction so i can go and auscultate for an ms or an mr if there is no murmur which i can detect i can think of diastolic dysfunction you got my point okay so sir, what if is if this? la yeah. is enlarged lead to uh, lead to should have a bifid uh, kind of p wave na again sir? In, how many see again remember sensitivity of atrial and an anomalies we should not say atrial enlargement we should say atrial abnormality okay sensitivity of atrial anomalies abnormalities on the ecg is poor so you look at v1 the depth and width is more than 1 mm again that is enough to commit upon la enlargement all right the i'll tell you from my practice getting a bifid p wave is very rare most of your patients usually you pick up la enlargement in v1 what you see as a p mitral is traditionally described in mitral stenosis patients okay in routine clinical practice remember you can pick it up either from v2 or in lead v1 and in this case lead v1 gives you a clue all right the depth is more than 1 mm the width is more than 1 mm it is clearly left atrial abnormality all right so from this i imply that this patient was probably suffering from pulmonary edema why because this patient has structural heart disease in the form of uh, lvh with strain and he has la abnormalities which indicates elevated la pressures so what do you expect this echo to show left atrial 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 will be elevated more than 34 uh, uh, can you repeat the question the la volume index will be increased yeah okay that is part of atrial the atrial atrial atrial. Yeah, you would expect a thick lv with a small cavity with a dilated la that is what you would typically expect again it could be a dilated cardiomyopathy but this is what we generally expect from this particular ecg you can see very good height of complexes and also i mm. would expect diastolic a thick lv small cavity with a large la and diastolic dysfunction now irrespective of whatever doppler parameters i think one of you said elevated uh, uh, increased lavi so that is also going to be there but from this i think you should come in. this is one thing which gives you a diagnosis of probably acute pulmonary edema because there is structural heart disease in the form of lvh la enlargement okay and there is tachycardia so again remember the rate is 100 so this patient is probably partially treated so when he came the rate would have been far higher okay so sinus tachycardia that is probably one of the manifestations of uh, treated heart failure la abnormality indicates an elevated la pressure which probably would indicate diastolic dysfunction in this patient where the patient does not have a mitral valve disease LVH with strain, probably hypertensive heart disease, and a left anterior hemiblock. All right, is there any confusion on this? Would anyone like an alternative diagnosis? Can be a lateral wall MI, sir. Now, why do you? Where is the ST elevation in order to come into lateral wall MI? No, sir. Ah, uh, in stomach, sir. again see again uh, it could be an enstemy all this could be precipitated by a uh, uh, ischemia ischemia can precipitate but, but again we don't have information for that you got my point ischemia okay. is one of the common precipitating factors for heart failure i am telling you with this available ecg you have to go and guess what is the clinical status of the patient so again see acute with acute heart failure you have uh, 10 different precipitating factors starting from drug non compliance uh, drugs like nsaids um, ischemia renal artery stenosis you have a lot of differential diagnosis for that but from this diagnosis i think after seeing the ccg with this available information i think you should make a diagnosis that this is probably heart failure probably due to some degree of diastolic dysfunction okay and the la abnormality is going to be your key clinching factor so why okay. lhb see hypertension one of the common precipitating one of the common manifestations of hypertension on ecg is the left anterior hemiblock okay your left anterior fascicle uh, tracks beside the septum okay in the left side of the intraventricular septum and it is a thin uh, small it's a thin fragile long fiber okay so any small degree of abnormality can cause anything anything can cause 
uh, left anterior have anything can cause ischemia in that particular area and can cause a hemi block okay so it's one of the common manifestations see if you have you have hypertension you have lvh okay so hypertension without lvh is obviously the best hypertension with lvh on the ecg is worse prognosis if you have lvh with strain it's an even worse prognosis lvh with hemi block even worse prognosis lvh with left anterior hemi block with la enlargement it's an even worse prognosis it's one of the manifestations of a hypertensive heart disease ecg left anterior hemi block and by left anterior hemi block is very very common all right you want to know why it's a left anterior hemi block or yes yes sir yes sir yes sir yes sir. you can see see you can what is the axis of this patient normal axis sir okay axis i think in this case left axis see, it again depends ah it's the uh, mild left axis sir okay there is a certain degree of mild left, left axis deviation you can see that one and avl start with a q okay those hmm. are a typical manifestations of a left anterior hemi block okay again i'm not going in for a reason of the left anterior hemi block because i just want you to uh, know about the in the uh, the information you can get from the ccds okay so this was the actual presentation so 50 year old male hypertensive diabetes came in acute pulmonary edema bp of 270 140 skipped oral antihypertensives for one week creatinine 1.9 ecg was taken after ntg and through survey okay so this was your particular thing so what i wanted was acute but this patient was in acute pulmonary edema and why okay so if you look at the marrow lectures in your hff presentation we have uh, almost a similar case and i have told you why these patients go in for acute pulmonary edema why uh, these kind of patients are very sensitive to changes in blood pressure and blood volume all right so this was obvious this was somewhat what echo looked like okay so so normally in every patient lv edp is equal to the la pressure is equal to the pulmonary capillary vas pressure so when your lv edp increases as with gastric dysfunction your la pressure increases your pulmonary venous pressure increases there is going to be exudation of fluid in your lungs and the patient can go in for pulmonary edema all right okay so that is it so we'll go for the next one again just appreciate the amount of information you can get so again it's almost the same patient 59 year old hypertensive diabetic smoker acutely sick ecg taken after the patient was partially treated i'm giving you one more information cag was was done in 2010 for triple, triple vessel disease was advised bypass not done defaulted all drugs all right so hypertensive diabetic smoker acutely sick partially treated had a triple vessel disease what was advised bypass not done and this is the ecg okay so i'll go over the questions again these questions are almost the same what do these patients suffer from why what are the evidences and what do you expect the echo to show so this is the ecg tell me what do these patients suffer from and why what is the likely diagnosis of this patient patient was having an uh, ischemic cardiomyopathy sir so he had an you must tell me why you must tell me why uh, see normally prior, if, uh, with the background of uh, cad and uh, yeah. cabg was not done he would have had a systolic dysfunction which have precipitated the pulmonary edema so you are agreeing this patient would have been in pulmonary edema right okay yes sir so again so okay again the same thing is probably some severe sinus tachycardia underlying structural heart disease so what if if we do an echo for this what would you find there will be an uh, dilated lv okay so uh, why do you think a what what in this particular ecg tells you it's a dilated lv the rbf and RBF what what would be the likely ef in this patient it would be less than 30% sir ah you can't say less than 30 you can say very poor ef yeah. so poor. again again i'll agree it's an acute pulmonary edema okay i think nobody will have probably have a question regarding it right it's acutely sick patient partially treated with the cc i think acute pulmonary edema is pretty much straight forward okay the next question is why do you say it's an ischemic dilated cardiomyopathy with this ecg okay ischemia is obviously there it's cag shows triple vessel disease with this ecg what does this ecg show with suggestive of a dilated cardiomyopathy and why do you say it's having a very poor ejection fraction all q wave q wave is in b23 avf okay but uh, uh, how do you know it's the lv is dilated with this poor avf something else something else 
ब्रॉड की बात है तो थ्री एरिया गोल्ड इज कॉम्प्लेक्स इज इन गोल्ड बर्ग इज इन या लो वोल्टेज कॉम्प्लेक्स there is low voltage i don't think you can say low voltage complex because the depth of the s is fairly big in v4 and v5 broad okay. qrs in lead 2 3 avf i don't think uh, it's not very significantly okay. broad enough okay AF. look at the r waves yeah patient is an af that's one thing you all missed look at the r no waves progression of r wave there is no r waves anywhere you look at the, there's hardly a small r wave in v3 v4 v5 you look at the r wave in 1 2 avl V two, V three, V four, V five, V six. There's hardly any R waves. All right. Is there? There are no R waves. So it's all very poor. My very poor scheme. Uh, uh, probably necros myocardium. You got my point. So you don't expect this patient to have a very strong rejection fraction. All right. What is the axis of this patient? Isn't it a lead reversal, sir? AVR is showing positive. Why again? That's an arm skew. What is the axis of this patient? Right, right. Right axis. It's extreme northwest axis. So remember, see, you have an LV. I I can't obviously. Can I draw on this? Is there any way? Okay. I, let's see if I can draw on this. Yeah, there's an option for me to draw. Okay. Okay. So this this works. So you have the LV like this, right? Okay, this is the LV with all its thickness. So your normal axis goes towards the towards sixty degree. That's why the LV is. So you can see this axis is going exactly in the opposite direction, the northwest direction. All right. So basically, what see? Why does the axis shift so much? Axis shifts occur because there's a problem with the muscle, or there's a problem with the conducting system. All right. In this case, all that muscle, all this LV muscle is probably necrosed. non viable territory that is why the axis is going exactly in the opposite direction okay are we clear on that particular point okay sir avr is showing positive wave isn't it lead reversal no it, not, it does not mean lead reversal see what is actually happened is see what is actually happened is there is no lv basically all your lv myocardium is necros that is why your axis is going in the opposite direction so remember is the lv you have a large thick lv and that is what pulls the axis downwards towards 60 degrees and when all that muscle is damaged the axis is going towards the opposite direction you got my point it is not lead reversal all right so this patient is actually it's actually a burnt out dcm this is actually end stage dilated cardiomyopathy okay so one you know the history this patient was advised bypass uh, around 12 years ago Not done default in all drugs. In that case itself, you expect this patient to have a dilated cardiomyopathy. Remember, there is no hardly any R wave voltages, so probably all your muscles are probably necrosed. So you expect a dilated heart, a poorly contractile heart, and even your axis is northward, northwest. Okay, again, it's a, it's indicates basically all your myocardium is basically necrosed. And remember, this patient is in atrial fibrillation. All of this suggests a burnt out ischemic cardiomyopathy, ischemic dilated cardiomyopathy. Okay. so how do you stop this okay. so what do this patient suffer from i think we have to erase this also right it will come in the next slide by itself see one second okay so what do this patient suffer from this patient probably suffer from acute pulmonary edema okay why this patient would have an ischemic dilated cardiomyopathy as evidenced by your very poor Uh, r waves across the ecg your northwest axis and your atrial fibrillation all of this suggests out a burnt out dcm and you would expect the echo to show basically a dilated poorly contractile heart so you can see the globular heart you can see the heart is basically globular so it's a dilated poorly contractile heart okay so are we clear on this so we had one case of hef hef and one case of hef ref all right both presenting in acute pulmonary edema all right so i understand this might be a bit complex for you because you are not used to things like this i'm just telling you uh, that uh, that uh, forcing you to think in a different way okay so this is a sick patient in icu he is on infusions okay sick patient in the icu on infusions okay so this is the ecg i'll come to the questions later 
So this, what, what does the ECG show? What is the demography of the patient? I want to know whether the young patient, old patient, what type of patient he is, what is the likely diagnosis and what infusion he is probably on. So this is all guesswork. I want you to guess all these questions. What does the ECG show? The demography of the patient, likely diagnosis, and what infusion would he be likely on? So would anyone like to try this? Again, remember, it might be a bit too much, but again, remember, we want to uh, get as much information from this ECG as possible. All right. Matt. Okay, it is multifocal atrial tachycardia. Yes. Anything else? Old patient. Yes. Okay, why do you say old patient? Uh, Can anyone say, tell me what is the diagnosis? What is the underlying condition of this patient? COPD. Okay, why? Why COPD? I agree with COPD. Why? Lead on sign. Yeah, Matt is very sign. common in COPD. Yeah, Matt is very common in COPD, but the answer I expected is a lead one sign. Okay, you can see lead one here. It's very, very tiny. Look at it when compared to the other leads. Okay, this is called as lead one shine or shamrock sign. When you see tiny, uh, disproportionately tiny uh, QRS complex in lead one when compared to other things, it's a very specific sign for yeah. COPD. It's pra practically, it's not seen in any other condition. And remember, this is multifocal atrial tachycardia. You can see the three different morphologies of the QR of the P wave. So we have one morphology here, you have one morphology here, you have one morphology here, one here, one here, one here, varying morphologies, varying uh, QRS intervals. This is multifocal atrial tachycardia and it's due to a COPD. So what does ECG show? This ECG shows multifocal atrial tachycardia. And remember, MAT is typically an arrhythmia seen in elderly, sick respiratory patients. Your prototypical, it can be seen in any other patient also, but your prototypical arrhythmia in an elderly, sick respiratory patient. Likely diagnosis with this lead one sign, you should strongly consider COPD. And what infusion would you be likely on? Derifilin. Derifilin has an infusion. Something similar to aminophilin. Exactly. Aminophilin. Thing you, aminophilin. Thing you do is you stop the aminophilin. Okay, just see the amount of information you can get from the CCG. Even if nothing is available, this is the, you can know it is a COPD patient. You can know it's mat. You can probably guess that the patient is on aminophilin. All right. Instead of just looking at the CCG and commenting upon a diagnosis of mat, there is so much information you can get from the CCG. All right. So what does the ECG show? The show shows multifocal atrial tachycardia, a typical arrhythmia in elderly, sick respiratory patient. Probably he has COPD. Most likely he has COPD. And I think you should stop aminophilin in this patient. Okay, so Matt, elderly sick respiratory uh, patient, lead one sign or shamrock sign of COPD. Again, you can go back and read about this. Okay, I just want to communicate the amount of information you can get. Okay, so this was the patient, 76 year old male, known case of COPD on MDI, admitted with an acute exacerbation, and he was started on an aminophilin infusion, and that resulted in this arrhythmias. All right. So we come to case number four, pretty much similar case. 67 year old male came to the OPD for an executive health checkup. So he is stable. Can anyone tell me what this ECG is? You'll all be probably know this. It is commented as a normal ECG. So you look at the diagnosis, it's a normal ECG. Is it actually what would you what would you think in this patient? Again, we just said it, right? LVH. Ah, no, we just finished one case. Now nah, look at lead D1. Look at lead one. Okay, okay. Lead one sign. Yeah, exactly. It's lead one sign or shamrock sign. It, again, this patient came in for an executive health checkup. Although the ECD is reported as normal. Remember, lead one sign is practically not seen in any other condition. See, you can have small QRS complexes all over. That is different. If the other QRS complexes are big, but lead one is disproportionately small. You must always suspect COPD. It is practically not seen in any other condition. So you would like to ask about history of smoking and uh, cough and emphysematous chest and all those conditions. Again, don't rely on computerized uh, interpretations. You can rely on the intervals, but not on the interpretation. All right. So case number five. This was sent to me by one of you guys. Okay. So I'll just, I can have a look at this ECG. What would be the likely presentation, ECG findings and management? So what would be the likely presentation, ECG findings and management? Again, sent to me by one of you guys. You can have a look at it. Take your time. I think we are pretty much going too fast. 
All right. Very deep waves. Okay, that is one. Post surgery patient. I don't think you can say post surgery from this. H O C M. Uh, I don't think you can say H O C M from this also. Uh, now, some cerebral T waves, giant T wave inversions. Okay, giant T wave inversion is one. Anything else? Uh, Raised I C B. Uh, giant TA, one of the mechanisms is raised ICT, but again, the ECG is showing R something else. RVH, RV. I don't think you can say RVH from this. The first criteria for right, right, right ventricular hypertrophy is R, right axis deviation. You commit upon RVH once you see right axis deviation. All right. There is no right axis deviation. What is the pupil prolongation? What is, see, we have giant, we have a prolonged TA, there's obviously going to be pupil prolongation, but what is the rhythm? Look at V1. What is the rhythm in this patient? Um. Okay. One is conducted, one is missed. Yeah, exactly. So what is that? Third blow is third. One AV block. So see, you see Two a T wave here. AV you can see the arrow, yeah. right? You can see the arrow, right? No, it is not AV dissociation. See, this PR is same. This P is conducted. Yes, yes, so this is P. You can see the arrow. So this is a conducted P. This is a non-conducted P. A conducted P, a non-conducted P, a conducted P, a non-conducted P. You can even see it here. Conducted P, a non-conducted P, a conducted P, a non-conducted P, a conducted P, a non-conducted P. So this is two is to an AV block. Anything else? Is, is it D-Vented? Super... No, it's not D-Vented. It's not D-Vented. Oh, it's not D-Vented. No. So is it, uh, so you see a two is to an AV block. What else is there? Is it a supra or an infra block? So what does V1 show? Is there a right bundle branch block? Yes, sir. Yeah, exactly. You can see one is showing a slurred okay. complex here. AVL is showing a slurred complex here. V6 is showing a slurred complex. You can see a QR pattern here. Okay. It's a right bundle branch block with the two is to an AV block. And what does that signify? The Digitalis toxicity. No, it's not digitalis toxicity. It signifies that it's an infra ischian block. Okay. And remember, infra ischian blocks are unstable rhythms and the patient can suddenly die. So you see a 2 is to 1 AV block with a right bundle branch block. Okay. This signifies that's an infra ischian block. Okay. And you see giant T waves. So how do you uh, how do you relate that? What are the costs of giant T waves? No, I don't think you can say. What are the costs of giant T waves? Okay, one is ischemia. Two H is cerebral SH. disorders. SH. Three is HOCM. Okay. And SH. four is four SH. is yeah, it's cerebral disorders, as I said. Four is post cast post cardiac arrest and stroke Adams attack. All right. I taught you this in the lectures. So one is ischemia. Okay, two is post cardiac arrest and post stokes Adams. So patient has a, uh, say a complete heart block or a prolonged pause, goes in for syncope, and then they have this giant T waves, post cardiac arrest, HO, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, and all your cerebral conditions, especially SH. So this patient had a two is to an AV block, okay, with uh, probably a syncope, came with stokes Adams attack. Are we clear on that? I mean, it might be a bit too much for you, but this is what we want to learn from the ECG from. Okay. So this patient has a right bundle branch block with the 2 is to an AV block. So this is an infra ischian block. This is an unstable rhythm. And since you see giant T inversions, it probably indicates this patient would have had a syncope or would have a resistant cardiac arrest and would have come to you. All right. So likely presentation, probably syncope or resistant cardiac arrest. ECG findings I've told you. Management will probably to put in a pacemaker for this patient. Okay, any questions on this? It might be a see, I told you, for a first year PG, it might be a bit too much. But again, you should, uh, this is, I'm just showing you the amount of information you can get from the CCG. If I had said to you that this patient came in syncope, all of this would have been very easy, right? Okay, so we'll go for the next one. Okay, so this is the this is a very standard case which you get in your uh, casualty. So guess the BP and why.
What is the diagnosis, by the way? It's a very simple diagnosis. Inferior wall MI. It's an inferior wall MI. So guess the field. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. So why, why? RVMI. RVMI. Okay, you can I see a, ST, a slight, uh, maybe isometric or ST elevation V1, V1. suggestive of an RVMI. But is there anything more which says this patient would prefer, would be, okay, what would you do in this patient? We cannot always fluids. Fluids. Yeah, yeah, IV, IV fluids. fluids. So will this patient respond to IV fluids? Because of right atrial contraction. Okay, but will this patient respond to IV fluids? Yes, preload. No, I, I'm see. I'm saying this patient will not respond to IV fluids. So why? Uh, what else is there? Block. There's no complete heart, heart block. block. There's no complete heart block in this patient. Now, what is the rhythm in this patient? Junctional rhythm. You see all this wavy, wavy complexes here. What is this? Junctional. Yeah, KF, exactly. This is not only really an infra. So you can see a posterior wall also. Infra, post, RVMI. This is actually in AF also. Okay, and these patients have profound loss of uh, I mean, hypotension. Why is that? So why do you give IV fluids in RVMI? It promotes left right atrial contraction. Now one guy, so one, one of you can answer. It promotes right atrial contraction. Okay, so how many people say that it promotes right ventricular contraction? Right atrial, sir. Okay, see, the typical answer which all you PGs give is that when you give IV fluids, your right ventricle stretches, Frank Starling mechanism acts, mm -hmm. it contracts better and uh, the BP improves, but that's actually wrong. Remember your RV is ischemic. The ischemic RV cannot increase its contraction. RA contraction. Yeah, exactly. The RA is the one which is going to maintain cardiac output. Remember your pulmonary artery pressure is low. It is 25 by 10. Okay, so your RA increases its contraction and improves cardiac output. This should be a very clear point to you. Okay. It is almost 90, 95% people, of your people are going to say that you increase IV fluids, your RV stretches, your RV increases in contraction as per Frank Starling mechanism and you have an increase in BP. That is absolutely wrong. The RV is ischemic. It does little blood flow. It won't contract. It won't increase its contraction. What increases its contraction is the RA is the one which stretches. The RA increases its force of contraction and that is how it pushes it across into the pulmonary artery. So if you have impairment in RV, in RA contraction in RVMI, we have profound hypotension and these patients do not respond to IV fluids. Is that clear? Yes, not sir. only the RV is gone, your, if the RA is also for some reason gone, these patients have profound hypotension. They do not, they do not respond to IV fluids. So what are the factors which cause RVMI not to respond to IV fluids? Atrial fibrillation. So there is atria has ineffective contraction. Atrium is also infected, so associate atrial infarction. Remember the proximal RCA supplies not only the RV but also the RA. So atrial fibrillation, associate atrial infarction, CHB and junctional rhythm. See in CHB, in junctional rhythm, the P wave and the QRS are on top of each other. They contract simultaneously. So your RA contracts against a closed tricuspid valve. It has inefficient contraction. Okay, so the RA is contracting against a closed tricuspid valve. So again, complete heart block. You can see here. Some of these, there is AV dyssynchrony and, and some of these contractions are against a closed tricuspid valve. And HFF is a bit complex, I won't go into that. So these are your five conditions where uh, RVMI does not respond to IV fluids. Even if you lyse this patient, sometimes when you lyse the patient, you can find, find out this patient's hypotension, you look at the monitor, you will see AF. After some time your BP picks up, you look at the monitor, probably is gone for sinus rhythm. Very, very common, okay. so. Factors which are RVMI does not respond to IV fluid are atrial fibrillation, atrial infarction, CHB, junctional rhythm, and HFF. Okay, so when you see the CCG, it's not only really infra post RVMI, obviously due to a proximal RCA occlusion, due to a red thrombus, and all those things which you have said before. This patient also has atrial fibrillation. And atrial fibrillation and RVMI can cause profound hypotension because of loss of a right atrial contraction. Okay. This patient, if you take in for a thrombolysis, is likely to do bad because obviously there is no BP. You would need to do a primary PSA for this patient. Am I clear in this for this? Yes. Yes, sir. Okay. So this patient, do not thrombolyze this patient. Of course, if you are in some rural hospital which has no access, or you can try thrombolysis, but thrombolysis is destined to fail. Okay. No BP, thrombolysis is destined to fail. That is why proximal LAD occlusions and proximal RC occlusions do worse when with 
the when when you thrombolyze because patient's bp is likely to be very low okay higher the bp better the thrombolysis is going to be lower the bp worse the thrombolysis then why do you have a cut off of 180 say 110 for thrombolysis i say higher the bp higher the thrombolysis thrombo bleed bleed for the risk of ic bleed okay at a bp of 240 170 your thrombo cardiac thrombolysis is going to be better but you will probably develop an ic bleed okay so you do that so this is the patient you take up for a primary pc again do not stop with the diagnosis of inferior volume okay so again it's not that you just look at the ccg and say inferior volume and uh, uh, shun this patient somewhere else okay this is a patient you have to go deeper you should know this patient will not respond to iv fluids thrombolysis is likely to fail and push him for a primary pc okay that is why you must put in efforts to learn about ecgs okay so is the uh, yeah. st depression in keto significant yeah it indicates a posterior volume so you have a st depression in v1 v2 and v2 in posterior volume right yes sir. yeah so what happens is the st elevation of rvmi you have in v1 you have an st depression of a posterior volume mi versus an st elevation of an rvmi you got my point there's a there's a tug of war going on so you have an st depression due to the posterior volume mi and the st elevation due to the rvmi okay and that is why even a minimal st elevation becomes significant okay so it is a sum total so if the posterior volume mi is dominant you have an st depression if the rvmi is dominant you have an st elevation am i clear yes sir okay so this is a very significant mi okay again this was uh, i think one of you guys sent me the ccg today so i'm not sure if he is uh, there in this chat so if he is there thank you anyway okay so, so this was a, how are we yeah. going to manage this patient how how are we going to manage this patient you have to do a primary to... psa for this patient see if you have no other option you can thrombolyze it okay so but can we give minor drops you can give inotropes again see that's a problem with that i usually don't go in for that level see when you give noradrenaline or uh, adrenaline or dopamine they not only cause increase inotropy they are also going to cause pulmonary arterial vasoconstriction so that is bad okay see if you want to save this patient you have to do a primary pc you can give iv fluids see there's no harm in trying iv fluids you can give inotropes but again the success rate is going to be very low unless you open up the artery You got my point. All yes, of sir. these are supportive measures. They are not definitive treatment strategies. Okay. So the aim is you do a primary PSA, push this patient for a primary PSA as soon as possible. Okay. So this ECG yes. was sent to me by one of you guys. I'm not sure if he's there on the session. Okay. So the story goes like this: This is a 65-year-old gentleman. Okay. He presented. He presented with chest pain. Okay. It was seen by a cardiologist, and the cardiologist did an echo and said that there is RWMA. patient was in profound hypotension tension okay the cardiologist said that there is no clear cut st elevation this is probably an end stemy 10 minutes after the ccg the patient developed a vt and died okay so the student asked me what was wrong with this so are we clear so patient with chest pain ecg taken seen by a cardiologist rwm on the echocardiogram diagnosed to have end stemy because there is no clear cut uh, st elevation just a small doubt on the previous yeah. case though Um, yeah. that patient had an atrial fibrillation, right? Would we reverse exactly. the atrial fibrillation because he came in shock? If you're not able to like do a primary PSA, the culprit has to open. See, see again, see why you do a shock in atrial fibrillation is because if there's a very fast atrial rate and you want to uh, uh, revert that patient to sinus or the mass much as soon as possible. Here it doesn't really help, right? You can try giving a shock, but again, remember this is an ischemic myocardium. There are lot the the myocardium is likely to be very sensitive. you shock him probably might go in for a vf all right so that is the uh, trying to revert it to sinus rhythm is not a priority it is trying to open up the culprit artery you got my point all of this you can discuss but you must open up the culprit artery as soon as possible okay all sir. right see people have tried a lot of things people have tried putting a lead in the atria putting another lead in the ventricle giving av synchrony and then trying to pace to improve bp lot of things have been tried but remember open up the culprit artery as soon as possible so again we'll come back to this case so chest pain elderly individual patient in hypotension cardiologist sees this does echo sees rwma diagnoses this patient to have instemy because there is no significant st elevation 
10 minutes later patient develops vt and dies what is the ecg show qrb Atrial fibrillation with QRBB. Okay. Right. You right. think it's an anterior one, MI? Atrial fibrillation with QRBB. What? No. What right. is the underlying right. deviation? Uh, what is right. the underlying right. diagnosis? Why didn't QRS? LBB. Okay. No, it's an RBB. It's not an LBB. Atrial fibrillation with QRBB. Okay. What is the underlying Anterior diagnosis? Anterior wall, MI. Then QRBB. why does V two? So why does V two does not show an ST elevation? See, if you are saying there is a QRBB proximal lady, then V1, V2 should show the ST elevation. Na? There is Sir, the maximum ST, uh, ST elevation in pulmonary embolism. Oh, one minute, we'll come to that, yeah? Lead 3 and AVF is there. Exactly, see, this, is a, this is an inferior wall MI. You can see. Yeah, inferior wall MI. There is slight ST, ST elevation. Yeah, slight ST elevation. You can see QAVs here in 2, ST elevation in 3, slight ST elevation AVF. But what is more significant, you can see the reciprocal change in AVL, all right? You can see the slight ST depression in AVL. Mm -hmm. Is that appreciated? Yes sir. yes, sir. Yes, sir. Remember, reciprocal changes occur earlier than the normal artery change, normal leads changes. Reciprocal changes, this is called burn bomb sign, B I R N B A U M. So, AVL ST depression occurring in inferior volume. This is what gives you a clue that this could be an inferior volume. The reciprocal ST depression in AVL. When one shows a slight ST depression, do not wait for the ST depression to be very, very prominent. That is too late. You must pick up uh, subtle changes on the ECG. Okay. Sometime I will come. I used to, I, I did a presentation once called Catching STEMIs for the MDPGs of Trivandrum Medical College. Sometime I might do that for you guys. But remember, AVL showing ST depression. You can see a QT inversion, slight ST elevation in the inferior leads. Okay. You can see V4 showing a slight ST elevation, V5 maybe. It's not, these are all suggestive of an infralateral volume. Okay. And even this actually, I'll come to the RVMA a bit later on. Okay, but there is clear cut evidence to suggest that this might be an inferior volume. I don't think you can ignore that and say it's an NSTEMI. All right. Okay. Yes, sir. So remember, this is not a florid change. These are subtle changes, and your skill lies in picking up subtle changes. So why? So I say there's an RVMI. So why does the why is there no ST elevation in V1? Remember the right, there's a right bundle branch block and right bundle branch block may, be, may have an associated ST depression. Okay, so that is probably masking the, I told you there's a tug of war between the posterior wall changes and the uh, RV changes. So the posterior wall changes and the right bundle can cause ST depression. Your RVMI can cause ST elevation. That is why probably you're not getting a very strong um, ST elevation in V1. But remember the clinical scenario, profound hypotension and patient is in atrial fibrillation. All of this are suggestive of an inferior wall MI. I'm not expecting you to diagnose this an inferior wall MI with an RV MI with a posterior wall and lateral wall MI. But again, this is something you need to pick up. Look at the ST depression in AVL. A half millimeter ST depression is enough. Okay, do not wait for it to become more than one millimeter. Again, the, the criteria says one millimeter, but we need to pick it up as soon as possible. Please remember that. Okay, so this is actually a subtle infra posterior lateral and RV MI, a large MI. Okay. The patient is in hypotension because of the RVMI and because of the atrial fibrillation. This should have been picked up at a cardiologist's point of view. Okay, I think this should this could have been missed at an MD level. Can you please repeat the sign name sir? Sign name. Sign name. Sign name. Any doubts? So can you repeat the sign name sir? Born on. Okay, so I think uh, we'll go for the next one. Hello. So case seven. Okay, so again, 30-year-old in so, shock, absolutely stable, no comorbidities, no hypertension, no diabetes, nothing. Yeah. No, I, the question is not yet complete. So this is, you can have a look at the CCG. Okay, 30-year-old in shock, no comorbidities. After DC version, this is CCG, BP has come back to normal. Okay. The diagnosis, why did this patient go for shock? So what is the CCG suggest of? ECG is not old? visible, sir. You're not able to see the ECG. No, sir. This is the, the same. This is the previous the CCG, sir. Previous and the last ECG, inferior wall MI was, is there, sir. So it's not changing. So I even see this, these all slides. Are you able to see the slides which I'm changing? Yes, right sir. Now? 
yes sir now we can see no sir you are not able to see it can you see the side right now yes sir yes sir it is sensitive okay so 30 year old in shock with no comorbidities okay this is the ecg absolutely normal patient healthy patient playing badminton for a very long period of time no issues this is ecg after dc version with a bp of 120 so why do, what is the diagnosis why was this patient hypotension hocm so hocm so why did this patient go for hypotension atrial fibrillation exactly so atrial fibrillation is a very very poorly tolerated arrhythmia in hocm so remember what happens is when you have a thick lv with a small cavity something like this your the L lv edp is going to be high your la pressure is going to be high so your la stretches the la increases its force of contraction okay the la is going to play a central role in the maintenance of cardiac output 30 to 50 percent of cardiac output may be maintained just by the la so because the lv edp is so high the la stretches la increases the force of contraction and the LA plays a central role in the maintenance of cardiac output up to 30, sometimes even 50%. So when you have loss of LA contraction, this can result in shock. So remember in hypertrophic obstructive cardiomyopathy, anything, AS, coactation of IR or all your left side outflow track lesions, AF is a very poorly tolerated arrhythmia. Okay. You can see clear cut AF. Okay. So Sir, kindly explain how, to how did we know it was HOCM? See, this could be any, it could be any, it could be hypertension, could be uh, iatric stenosis, could be coactation of aorta, could be HOCM, could be any of the uh, left side outflow lesions. But again, I told you patient has no comorbidities, patient is fine, perfectly normal, paying badminton, all those things. So I, it's unlikely that a severe coactation of aorta or a severe iatric stenosis would be perfectly asymptomatic playing badminton for us together. Again, BP was normal, no comorbidities. So a fair guess, remember young patient, this should be it's auto, automatically you should start thinking of uh, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Okay. You, no, it could be a coactation of aorta, but again, statistics, that's what I'm saying. Patient is perfectly fine, all those things. I think we should consider a diagnosis of uh, HOCM. Again, we are going in for the most likely diagnosis. Okay. Again, the, you. you can say it's a coactation of aorta. Again, the same thing applies. AF is, again, a very poorly tolerated arrhythmia. Okay. All your outflow track lesions, AF is a very poorly tolerated arrhythmia. Okay. Remember that concept. Okay. So case H, okay. So your job is to tell me why is the professor angry? Okay. So 36 year old female diagnosed to have GBS posted for plasma pheresis. So why is the professor angry? Patient is hypokalemia. Exactly. Hypokalemia. So, yeah, this was never GBS. Okay. So this patient, all you needed was to give this patient potassium chloride and this patient was- Hypokalemic periodic paralysis. I don't think you can say it's hypokalemic periodic paralysis. I can say this patient had 10 episodes of diarrhea, right? Maybe thyrotoxic paralysis, all those things can apply. Again, this could be the first episode. But again, it's just hypokalemia. It is easy to say periodic paralysis is a bit difficult. You just say it's hypokalemia and nah? leave it. So you can see that uh, there is prominent U waves. Remember, this is not a P wave. This is a U wave. This is your T wave. And it's a prolonged Q U interval. Okay, this is hypokalemia. So the importance of looking at the ECG. So remember, is there lead one sign in this ECG also? Yeah, there is a certain amount of lead one sign in this ECG <laughs> also. I'm not sure why. Okay. <laughs> okay, this is from my PG days. All right. Okay, so we come to the last case of the day. Okay, this is a case which I missed actually. So when I had this YouTube channel, I planned to put it, but then I did not. Okay, this is a case I missed. Okay. 52 year old female critically ill. Okay, she's come to you in a critically ill state. ECG taken two weeks ago for a postmenopausal bleed. Okay, so this is the ECG. It's taken two weeks ago when she presented to the gynecopy for postmenopausal bleed. Don't ask me why a gynecologist takes ECG. I'm not very sure why it was done. Okay, okay, so ECG take, taken two weeks ago for a postmenopausal bleed. ECG now when the patient is critically ill. I have a comparison also. So, Again, I expect the diagnosis, what are your ECG findings, what will be the likely presentation, and the likely costs. So again, this is your comparison. So you can have a look at this and try to guess it. And remember, I misdiagnosed this case. The diagnosis is actually picked up by a physician. The cardiologist misdiagnosed it, and uh, it was picked up by a physician. Sir, Wolf Parkinson? Why do you say Wolf Parkinson? There is no short PR interval or a delta wave. Pulmonary embolism. Again, why pulmonary embolism? No, 
It's one, two, uh, three. Uh, lower three. ECG, lower ECG is the one which is pathological. So why pulmonary embolism? S1, Q3, T3. That is the worst thing to possibly say in a pulmonary embolism case. Like S1, Q3, T3 is inferior and anterior. Okay, that is one very good sign. See, S1, Q3, T3 is the most useless sign in pulmonary embolism. It's called Medjin White sign. Okay, it is neither sensitive, neither specific. It is a completely useless sign. Okay. What is more suggestive? What is the, has the axis changed? Yes. When you get a, the axis yes. going right toward, you can see a S wave coming up in lead one. The height of the R wave decreasing in, in one. Remember the S wave in lead one. Okay. Whenever you see a newer, new onset of a right axis deviation, that is when you start thinking of pulmonary impulse. So you can see a new onset S wave in lead one. Forget about the Q3, T3. Remember Q3, T3 can be normally seen in lead three. Okay. So the new onset of S wave in lead one, you can see here, a new onset of S wave in lead one. You can see the incomplete RBB here. You can see T inversions in the inferior and anterior leads. All this are suggestive of pulmonary embolism. And remember, I teach ECGs and even me being a cardiologist, I miss this diagnosis. It was picked up by a physician. Okay. So sometimes it's always better to listen to your colleagues also. Okay. So this was the case. So again, diagnosis, Why? what was the likely cause of this present illness? Patient perfectly stable. She started on uh, tranexamic acid. Exactly, that's what. See, often you find you know, these females who present to the gynecologist with uh, uterine bleed, fibroid or something, they present with tranexamic acid and they present with a pulmonary embolism. I'm not saying tranexamic acid is bad. You see a middle-aged female or a young female and with pulmonary embolism, you automatically ask this question and you invariably find a non-pregnancy situation they have taken tranexamic acid. So this is a diagnosis. 52-year-old female hemoglobin of 6. Okay, I'll just come to that. Hemoglobin 6 started on tranexamic acid, now coming with severe dyspnea. Pulse high, BP normal, saturation low, CVS normal, RS normal. Okay, again, one more thing. When you have a severe dyspnea in the presence of a normal clinical examination, think pulmonary embolism. So you can see all of these findings are suggestive of pulmonary embolism. Okay, again, the ECG itself is very, very suggestive. If you want to teach somebody, okay, what are the ECG findings of pulmonary embolism is a very good thing. You can see the S wave in lead one indicating a right axis deviation, your incomplete RBB, your inferior anterior leads showing T inversion. Okay. So acute right heart strain. So new right axis deviation, S wave in lead one, very, very important. Forget about the other two. Tall R wave in lead one, right bundle branch block, T inversions in anterior infidates, right atrial anatomy. All of this are suggestive of pulmonary embolism. Again, remember this ECG was not to teach about pulmonary embolism, it's rather to show you that you can pick up a lot of things on ECG. Okay, so we're finished with uh, all your discussions. So this is the points I want to see your eyes only see what your mind knows. So that is what the, the uh, you should, that is what the, should develop more and more knowledge. It's very, very important. Okay, see, we often pick up this ECG, it's some sort of a torture for us. Okay, it's, uh, we don't know how to read the ECG. We find it mysterious. We are more worried about missing things rather than picking it up. And that's why most of you people don't even uh, put in the effort to learn ECGs. Okay, remember ECG reveals its secret only to a true student. Okay, you should have a love for learning more about ECGs. Then you should have the knowledge of the potential for ECGs and learning is a lifelong process. Remember this, every ECG tells you a story, but it does so in a different language. You have to learn the language of ECG. It's very, very important. Every ECG tells you a story, but it does so in a different language. All right, and remember, you have to learn that language, either from books, either from YouTube, either from somebody teaching you, either from, from some lecture somewhere, you have to learn that language. It is a fundamental skill to learn ECG. I don't think, even if you are a gynecologist or even if you are an orthopedician also, you should know something about ECG. So it's, a, it's actually a very fundamental skill and we are often very frightened of it. So the main purpose of this discussion as a whole was to show you the amount of information you can gain from this ECG not to teach you the ECG manifestations of pulmonary embolism or not to teach you the ECG manifestations of heart failure. I've deliberately hidden the history. I've only told you, shown you the ECG and from that ECG, how much information you can get it. Okay, so I think this ends the session. I'll take some questions. Okay. Uh, hi, so, everyone, please raise your hands if you have any questions for Dr. Nishan, sir. So can I repeat the same name? So Bonald Singer. 
it's burn bomb b i r n b a u m okay burn bomb burn bomb b i r n b a u m okay i have i don't have a textbook reference for this this was said to me by one of the most famous electrophysiologists of india narasimhan sir okay so i learned this in okay. one of his conferences okay so i don't have a textbook reference but narasimhan sir is a very very big name in electrophysiology in india okay so Thank any you. other question yeah Okay, so uh, what's one question? How to send me ECGs? So this is my email ID. Okay, I have two mail IDs. So uh, when you send me ECGs for discussion, please ensure the ECGs are good quality so they can be presented with a brief clinical history, and also mention your name and present occupation. Okay. Remember, see, this is a continuous learning process. Even I am still learning about ECGs. I that's why I told you, uh, in spite of so many years of experience reading ECGs. So uh, I've learned ECG from first year of MD medicine. So in spite of so many years of learning, still I have missed a pulmonary embolism. It's a very very basic diagnosis, but even I have missed pulmonary embolism. So again, you will miss, but again, it is the improvement which counts. Okay. So I hope I have uh, inspired you in learning more about ECG. That's what I wanted to tell you. So it is not about what teaching you. It's I want to you to inspire. you to learn more about ecg so take up the ecg from that packet and start reading it remember every ecg tells a story you just have to know its language so if there are any more doubts i'll be i'll be answering them otherwise we can close the session remember you will have a feedback form for this okay uh, right vaishna yes vaishna? sir it's uh, common you know you, yeah, you will have a feedback form for this so uh, again this was just an introductory session so just to show you the potential of ecgs so i'll be discussing i think weekly once we can have a session like this if you guys are obviously interested and uh, we can choose different areas so what i what i was planning is that uh, whatever ecgs you send me we can discuss and maybe some ecg topics so this is just an introductory session so remember again try to get better in learning on ecgs so if there are any there are any questions i'll be taking them otherwise we can close the session and please do remember to send in the feedbacks